Shalom, this is Reverend John Ferret, and welcome to the continuing series, The Gospel According to Moses on the Book of Exodus. And we are in the main lesson 47, and 47, lesson 47, has got everything to do with Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17, and we're focusing in on the Ten Commandments. So we're on the 14th episode, the 14th lesson of lesson 47, and we're in part 2. So once again, we're focusing in on the seventh commandment, Thou shalt not commit adultery. And we have to realize that the Hebrews coming out of Egypt were the first ones to hear the Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. God inspired Moses to write the Torah. And they're the first audience coming out of Egypt. And so when they hear the words of Genesis and Exodus and the other books spoken to them for the first time, they hear God's instruction and they hear some things that really are quite amazing to them coming out of their assimilated life in the Egyptian culture. And also something completely different from the ancient pagan cultures that were all around them. So yes, for the Hebrews coming out of Egypt, adultery was a great sin, just like all the pagan cultures around them. And yes, like the ancient, like the uh, pagan cultures around them in the ancient Near East, it was not about the sexual act, but about protecting the family and protecting the integrity of the family. It had nothing to do with the marriage. But like I said, Torah is inspired by the Lord, Yahweh. Inspired, Moses is inspired by God to, to, to write it for them, coming out of Egypt, and they are the first to hear the very words of God. And they're first to understand an amazing truth in the book of Genesis. When we read Genesis chapter 2 verses 24 through 25, the very words of God. For this reason a man shall leave his mother and his uh, he'll leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. The point being is it says that the man is going to leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. But in ancient Egypt, during the time of the Exodus, marriage was not divine. It had no connection to the gods whatsoever. So the Hebrews, because they had assimilated into that culture, probably understood marriage in the same way. So here's Adonai, inspiring Moses to write the Torah to this group of people, the Hebrews coming out of Egypt. They're the first ones to hear it. And he's trying to take Egypt out of the Hebrews, the mythology of the Egyptians, the religion of the Egyptians, the gods of the Egyptians, the, the whole social construct of the Egyptians. And so they hear Genesis chapter 2, verses 24 through 25 for the first time, the first people to hear it. And the first thing they understand is marriage is a divine institution. God created it. It's part of God's creation. But the second thing that they understand is marriage is between one man and one woman. This is an amazing truth. They're going to become one flesh. The Bible does not say that it's going to be a man and his wives that are going to basically cling together and be and become one flesh it doesn't even hint at polygamy god is teaching his people back in 1400 bc that marriage under the lord is one man and one woman now jesus god himself is here among us and so we come to mark chapter 10 verses 6 through 9 and Jesus says, But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. 
For this reason a man shall leave his mother, if a father and mother, and the two shall become one flesh, so that they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Jesus is referring to Genesis chapter 2, verses 24 through 25. That's the only Bible they had in Jesus' day. Jesus is God, and he's only repeating what he had Moses write. The idea of marriage, of being one man and one woman, this is not a new idea. He's only reminding them and us of the initial and the original plan that God had with regards to marriage. So yes, indeed, we can say that adultery is a great sin. And we would agree with the pagan nations of the ancient Near East at the time of the Exodus and even before. But now, based upon how God inspired Moses to write his instruction, his Torah, we find that it's a sin directly against God. He is the one who created marriage. Not like marriage in the ancient Middle East. I mean, there were many of those pagan nations that practiced polygamy. Marriage itself, like in Egypt, had no connection to the gods. But for the Hebrews, for them then, back in about 1400 BC and in Jesus' day, among his people there in ancient Israel and us today, we can say, yep, adultery is a great sin. It's against our community. And, against, and it's against the family, but the family, as we've learned, is one man and one woman. And it's a great sin against the Lord. Now it's interesting to note, again, that in Egypt we find that adultery was not an extramarital affair that's related to the married woman only. Adultery was an extramarital affair with a married woman or a married man. And it had nothing to do with sex between two unmarried people. And in the Bible, it's the same thing. And here, because of Genesis chapter 2, verses 24 to 25, God has basically said that marriage is between a man and a woman. And the Hebrews are coming out of Egypt and they understood, because of Egypt, that adultery is related to the woman and related to the man. Now it's interesting because there is a paper by a professor, Dr. Janet Johnson, and she is a professor of Egyptology at the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago. And she brings up several points that are really quite amazing. And it gives us some background, perhaps, to how the Hebrews looked upon marriage and divorce and adultery. Dr. Johnson says in the legal arena, both women and men could act on their own and were responsible for their own actions. This is in sharp contrast with some other ancient societies, actually most ancient societies, like ancient Greece, where women did not have their own legal identity. They were not allowed to own property. And in order to participate in the legal system, they always had to work through a male in order to participate in the legal system. Usually their closest male relative, a father, brother, husband, son, who was, was called their lord. Egyptian women were able to acquire, to own, and to dispose of property, real and personal, in their own name. They could enter into contracts in their own name. They could initiate civil court cases and could likewise be sued. They could serve as witnesses in court cases. They could serve on juries, and they could witness legal documents. The women very rarely did serve on jur juries, or as witnesses to legal documents is a result of social factors 
not legal ones. Another interesting fact in her paper, marriage in ancient Egypt was a totally private affair in which the state took no interest and neither did the gods and of which the state kept no record. There is no evidence of any legal or religious ceremony establishing the marriage, although there was probably a party. The preserved portion of the first late period story of Setni Kamwaset tells how Ahuri and Nafer Kapata fell in love and wanted to marry. Their parents agreed. So Ahuri was taken to Nafer Nefer Kapata's house. People, especially the father of the bride, gave presents. It was a big party. The two slept together and then they lived together and had a child. Basically, marriage was an agreement by two people and their families that they would live together, establish a household, and have a family. So marriage was just coming together. Basically, two families coming together and had nothing to do with the state or the gods. We read that there's little convincing evidence for polygamy, except by the king. But there's extens extensive evidence of serial monogamy in Egypt. Now, either party could divorce a spouse on any grounds, or basically without grounds, without any interest or record on part of the state. And as far as the ancient Egyptian concept of adultery, it consisted of a married person having sex with someone other than the person's spouse. It was just as wrong for a man to commit adultery as a woman. Now this gets very interesting because the Torah says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. It's being inspired by God. Moses is writing this to a people who are coming out of Egypt who knew this. And for the Hebrews, they're probably seeing, because they had assimilated to the Egyptian culture, it was just as wrong for a man to commit adultery as for a woman. The Egyptian system was fully family-centered, and the terminology for marriage and divorce was the same for both sexes. Adultery was defined in family terms and condemned for both men and women. And sex by unmarried individuals seems not to have been a major concern. And so, I mentioned again that the Hebrews had assimilated into that culture. So again, you can check by going to the website to study this, www.lightofmenorah.org, all one word, menorah is spelled M-E-N-O-R-A-H. So when you get to the website, take a look at the top selection of options. One of them on the right side is Other Resources. Click on that. And then that'll open up and it'll give you Podcast Playlists. Podcast Playlists. Click on that. And then all the Podcast Playlists will appear below. And you'll see the one, Exodus, the Gospel According to Moses, and you can click on that and then find Lesson 4, Part 2. And in Lesson 4, Part 2, we deal with the lesson of how, historically, we can see that the Hebrews had assimilated into the Egyptian culture after Joseph died and before they were enslaved. So, for the Hebrews, they may have understood the seven commandment with this understanding. In other words, the understanding that here we have adultery really is extramarital sex with the wife or extramarital sex with the husband. Because it's very similar to the way many in the church today did define adultery. Today in the church, Basically, it's adultery is a man having sex with a married woman, not his wife, or a woman having sex with a married man, not her husband. And in some cases in the church, they include also premarital sex or sex between two unmarried people. And that's not necessarily true. But then we read something quite dramatic. We come to Leviticus 20, 
verse 10. And it says, If there is a man who commits adultery with another man's wife, one who commits adultery with his friend's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress, and I find it interesting, the man is called an adulterer, the woman is called an adulteress. They're both involved in this. They will both will surely be put to death. A death penalty. And the death penalty in the Torah is when a man has sex with a married woman, not his wife. It's not the other way around. Why this difference? Why is it only related to the married woman having sex with a man that's not her husband? What's God teaching us? We're going to discuss this, and we're going to discuss a whole lot more as it's related to this seventh commandment of thou shalt not commit adultery. And until then, shalom.